We start this morning, friends, by paying tribute to Ken, whose untimely funeral was earlier this week and attended by a great many of you in this congregation. I understand his last words were, I've done this job so long, I could do it with my eyes shut. This may not have been the best idea for a professional lion tamer. We pray for those he left behind his colleagues, who inevitably had to pick up the pieces. Over the last few Sundays, we've been looking at a new heaven and a new earth, a shiny earth, where mobile phones actually work, and a sparkly heaven, where angels play all manner of musical instruments. All manner, that is, except for the evil recorder, which is saved for the demons in the fires of hell, and also for primary school concerts. The question today, brothers and sisters and other assorted relatives, is when? When will this happen? As this old earth creaks and groans like an Austin metro, we find ourselves looking at the calendar and asking, when will this prophecy come to pass? We long to know, we yearn to know, we need to know. These are critical questions, because many of us would be somewhat disappointed to miss the final of I'm an X Factor celebrity on ice. We are, however, given clues. And so this is something of a detective mystery, a puzzle for us to solve in the manner of one of Agatha Christie's great creations, such as Inspector Clouseau, or Jim Bergerac in Midsummer Murders. I will not attempt to predict exactly when Jesus will return in his triumph, which may be a reference to a car, especially since the same sentence usually includes the words herald. It is tempting to swirl the tea leaves of the Gospels and construct some Fibonacci prediction about when Jesus will return. But predicting the return of Jesus is surely more difficult than predicting the weather. But do we trust the weather forecast? We do not. In spite of the many hundreds of pounds the Meteorological Office spend on the latest state-of-the-art Commodore 64 machines. No one knows the day or the hour, says Jesus. And that, I imagine, is also a common problem on the island of Ibiza. We cannot determine when, but we do know it will be when the gospel has been preached to all the world. While there remain bleak pockets of this world where the gospel has not yet reached, such as the North Pole or Newport Pagnell services, then Jesus will not return. Keen to hasten the return of Jesus, I'm aware that Joan from this congregation has committed to praying for each of the motorway services on the M1. Indeed, her example has prompted a group of men to start praying for all roadside rescue services. Speak to Stuart if you want to join the AA men. Perhaps we can make better progress by considering the manner in which Jesus will return. Here we do have better indicators, for on the day of ascension, the angels said to the disciples, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And here we clearly have it. Jesus ascended into heaven. Ascended. He went up. Or more properly, according to the author of the book of Acts, who is thought by many to be Luke, and by some to be J.K. Rowling, says he was lifted up. So, heaven is up. 
Sometimes we are reluctant to consider that heaven is up. We like to think of it as a virtual place, somewhere hypothetical and mythical, rather like Atlantis or Papua New Guinea. We have also noted previously that Belinda Carlyle thinks that heaven is indeed a place on earth, as though you could get to heaven on the number 12 bus. No indeed, the number 12 bus does not approach heaven, because it skirts past Warwick and goes to Coventry. Pleasant, but not heaven. No, the Bible is quite clear that heaven is up. God resides in heaven and Jesus abides in heaven. Here, though, is a conundrum and one which ought to wake the sleeper in your midst, such as Dave in the fourth row. We know from our time spent watching cutting-edge news and current affairs programmes like John Craven's News Round, that our atmosphere traps gases such as carbon dioxide and sodium chloride. And these build up and cause the greenhouse effect, whereby scientists believe that by 2035 we will all be capable of growing tomatoes. But some gases are not trapped, they escape. They go up, up through the atmosphere, up into space, up surely to heaven itself, because heaven is up. These gases are hydrogen and helium, both lighter than air. Hydrogen, you'll be aware, that's what they used to use to fill up Ryan airships with, until it was discovered that they presented something of a fire hazard. Hydrogen, when ignited, rapidly combusts in the presence of oxygen to produce J2O, apple and mango, and that's what we find in heaven. Helium, on the other hand, is well known because it tightens the vocal cords and raises the pitch of one's voice. It's always a hoot at parties and weddings. This gas is the only possible means by which you can sing any song by the Bee Gees. And these are the principal gases in heaven, because heaven is up. And these gases have floated up, unlike more lingering gases such as methane. Two lessons then may be learned here about heaven which have some bearing on our earthly walk. One, the fact that there is explosive hydrogen in heaven means that there is likely to be a strict no-smoking policy, apart from in designated areas perhaps where the angels are fanning the hydrogen away with their wings. And the helium in heaven means that the cherubim and seraphim all will speak and sing in a falsetto voice which will allow them to hit the high notes of their hymns of praise such as Angels by Robbie Williams. So brethren and siblings, turning again to our theme of the triumphant return of Jesus, it is just possible that the first utterances of our Lord may be a little higher in pitch than we might have expected. And we shouldn't be alarmed by this. Moreover, we should endeavour to mask our inevitable amusement. To summarise so far, we know that nobody knows the day or hour of our Lord's return, but we do know he will descend to earth through the clouds from heaven, and it shouldn't come as a great surprise if he is singing Staying Alive on the Descent. We also understand that if the words of the hymn are believed to be kosher, that, brothers, this Lord Jesus shall return again with his Father's glory, with his angel train. It could be conceivably, therefore, that Jesus will arrive on something akin to the Hogwarts Express at platform nine and three quarters. What else can we glean from the clues in the Gospels? What 
Other insight can illuminate our understanding of this event so we recognise it when it happens. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2, Jesus warns us that he will return like a thief in the night. That is not to say that Jesus will arrive quietly and dressed all in black, tiptoeing round, stealing things, rather like an undertaker. Nor does it necessarily confirm that Jesus will return at night time because this would prove highly problematic for Christians in Australia where they are enjoying summer when it's night time in Britain and vice versa. It is, however, perfectly possible that Jesus will have to return a number of times in a rolling 24-hour period so as to arrive like a thief in the night around the world as appropriate in the different time zones. The Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. A similar thing happened when my cousin visited recently and the M25 was actually flowing and she arrived three hours earlier than I anticipated. Never have I vacuumed so fast in my life. I didn't even have time to read the instructions to the confounded bagless turbo whirlwind contraption that Sandra had bought on the computer. Attempting to save me some time, Sandra, bless her, had remarked that it had an on switch just the same as our previous vacuum cleaner that we had owned for 17 years. So then I had to try and find the instruction booklet for the old vacuum cleaner as well. Nature abhors a vacuum. That makes two of us. An hour when you least expect him. Consider this then. At what hour do you least expect him? Conversely, at what hour do you most expect him? An analogy, friends, from the world of electronic computing, which may help or if you're like me and can't tell a mouse from a gerbil, will serve to utterly confuse. Imagine you are preparing some electric presentation using power socket or hot point. You've been working on it all morning, and indeed most of the afternoon without a break. In my case, that's as long as it would take to insert a text box. But just when you're getting somewhere near finished, the computer crashes horribly and you are left facing a totally blue screen. Upon switching the computer off and on again, which I am assured by the experts is the way to cure all technical ills, you discover that you did not save your presentation and the computer didn't auto-save it either, through ignorance, through weakness, through its own deliberate malicious fault, usually the latter. The question is this, when do you expect the computer to crash? The simple answer is that you do not. You expect it to carry on without so much as a hiccup or a burp. That is why you do not save your work and that is why you get angry and rueful and shake your fist pointlessly at the screen when the computer does crash. Your computer will crash, surely, at the hour when you least expect it. If the owner of the computer had known at what time it would crash, he would have saved his document more often. A document can be saved... But we have to save it, or we risk losing it for eternity in the fires of hell. And if the document can be saved, how much more should we want to be saved? Christianity is not an auto-save option, ready to kick in whenever this old world crashes when Jesus reboots it. We have to be saved over and over again repeatedly enduring to the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. 
And if you are truly saved, then you cannot be lost or deleted. Sandra has checked through this last section and she assures me it makes some semblance of sense, which is more than can be said for me. To close then, the days when Jesus shall return will be difficult and traumatic, be reassured. We read in Matthew 24, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Jesus' triumphant return will cause a great anguish to many. And this does rather make me feel it will be in the middle of I'm an X Factor Celebrity on Ice, the final. Praise God for his infinite mercy, therefore, for sparing us from such punishment. Amen. <laughs>